let's go ahead and kick things off. Another episode of Free GMAT Prep Hour. I'm Jeff Vollmer. I'll be your guide today. Um, welcome to 2020. I don't know if any of you have New Year's resolutions. Maybe be done with the GMAT in 2020. That's a good one. Um, good luck. I'm here to help um, you achieve that goal. We do not need to be doing this 12 months from now. Is that right? Okay, so <laughs> yeah, hit your score goal in 2020. Yeah, good stuff, Gui. Cool, I have a lesson plan for us. It is quant focused today. I did a verbal one in December. I just prefer doing quant ones. It's my, I think it's my natural strength. Um, so I'm going to treat myself today by teaching you a quant lesson. Um, before we get to the content, just a reminder, you've got some other free options at your disposal through Manhattan Prep. Come try uh, free session one as a trial student. I just taught a session one yesterday, had a bunch of trial students there, it was a lot of fun. Love to see you in one of those. Um, you can try out Interact, our free sample of Interact, first five lessons there. Um, and you can always hop in on free GMAT prep hours. We usually offer two each month. So I think we have another one coming up next week, maybe, with Reed. I think Reed's teaching one in a week. That'll be fun. But let's go ahead and get started. I'm not going to tell you the, uh, the link between the questions today. Um, I'm just going to give you three questions off the bat. I'll give you six minutes to think through them if you... Um, have answers for all three questions, please hit me up in chat. And if you get all three questions right before time is up, I will send you to a shared Google Doc. I'll send you the link to a shared Google Doc with a bonus problem, and it is a monster. Um, if you're watching on the recording, I'll make sure I get the bonus problem up before the recording is done. So you've got six minutes on the clock. Um, yeah, you know what? Actually, Richard, I, I'm not sure how it works in the webinar. I think, yeah, you're in the private chat now. You'll just want to make sure you're sending the, uh, your messages to the panelists, to the panelists and not to everybody. So if you have your answer choice, just send it into the panelists. And that is me today, just the panelist. All right. Here are your three problems. I'm going to give you six minutes. I'll update you throughout. Let me know when you have your answers privately. Good luck.
That's been two minutes. You got four minutes left. All right, that's been four minutes. You have two minutes left. You have about one minute left. All right, getting a bunch of answers in here at the last minute. I'm going to go ahead and send you the link to the Google Doc. Although if I don't let you, if I haven't told you, you haven't gotten them all right. All right, wow, that was, I got a bunch of answers within about 20 seconds there. That's been about six and a half, six and a half minutes. Um, I think some of those are pretty tough. If you got all three, I believe I let you know. Um, go ahead and take a look at that shared Google Doc I just sent you. You should be able to access it. I have one more kind of bonus problem in there. Um, I'll make sure it gets on the video too. Let's go ahead and start talking through these things. Um, in case you haven't noticed, 
maybe I'll ask you guys to tell me in chat, um, what do you think the theme is of this problem set? What links all three of these problems? Um, Lloyd, I saw that you raised your hand. You're welcome to just, you know, let me know in chat. Anyone? JD is talking about averages. Uh, the number 13, does the number 13 have any, like, does that come up in all of these? I guess it kind of comes up in this problem and 130 is divisible by 13. I'm not sure if it comes up in the last problem. Wait, what was the last problem? Now I'm thinking of the bonus problem. Um, I don't think it comes up in the last problem. Uh, sums, products, yeah, factorials. <laughs> Consecutive integers, um, kind of. Consecutive integers or what you might think of as like evenly spaced or uniformly spaced numbers, right? Multiples of eight aren't, uh, multiples of eight aren't consecutive integers, but they are evenly spaced, right? They occur every eight numbers. And so I think I wanna dive into this first problem um, by backing up a little bit. And if you ever have trouble solving uh, a certain quant problem, one move you can make is to try solving an easier version of the problem. So let's do an alternative version of problem one. Uh, now, not the sum of a bunch of multiples of eight, but just integers between 10 and 20 inclusive. So some of the principles here, um, some of the principles here we will take with us as we approach the original problem one. So one uh, thing that someone mentioned, I can't remember who it was because it happened uh, you know, 20 messages ago now, is that this problem set has to do with averages and sums. And I think that's a good way of putting it. Uh, one thing we can import into this problem is our equation for how we, would, we determine averages, right? Average is you take the sum of all these items and you divide by how many items there were, right? Sum of terms divided by the number of terms. Well, because this is an equation, we should be able to move some of these pieces around. And so if we're trying to isolate the sum of a bunch of terms, we can just multiply both sides by how many terms there are and get this new equation. So this is nothing new, maybe for you, um, this average equation. But we're going to take with us some other important concepts of consecutive integers and uniformly spaced sets to make this equation more helpful. So for consecutive integers, because consecutive integers are like symmetrical, right, because the gaps are always the same, uh, the average of a set of consecutive integers will always be the same as the median. And you could test this out, right, if you, just test out numbers one, two, three, four, and five. It's fairly easy to see that the median is three. And with a set of integers like this, you could actually add this up pretty quick. Sums to 15, there's five terms. 15 divided by five is three, which is the median. So it holds. The average is the median. Another way to figure out the average of consecutive integers when maybe you have a longer list and it's tough to figure out what the middle number is, if there even is a number in the middle, is again, because consecutive integers create nice symmetry throughout, the average of the outermost terms, the first and last term, will actually be the average of the entire set, okay? So that's kind of a nice tool as well. So there's a couple ways to think about average. Now we also have to figure out how we're going to count the number of terms in a set. So quickly, like think about how many integers are there from 10 to 20 inclusive. You want to be careful here, right? The common mistake, and maybe enough of you have like fallen for this mistake in the past, is just to say, well, from 10 to 20, that's a gap of 10. There's going to be 10 integers. But that shouldn't hold up, right? Because if you did the number of integers from one to 10, you counted those on your fingers, you count off 10 integers, but the gap from one to 10 is nine. So what we're gonna have to do here is 
we can't just find the range, right? The distance from greatest to least. We have to add one back to our range. And so what we're gonna do now is substitute in for average and number of terms, these other expressions. We'll just take the average of the outer terms, 10 and 20, to figure out the overall average. We'll figure out the range between 10 and 20 and add one. If we multiply those figures, we should get the sum of our terms. Let's go ahead and do it. Average of the outer term. So the average of 10 and 20, 10 plus 20 divided by two should be 30 over two, which is 15. So we'll go ahead and call this 15. And then the range, the range is the distance here from 10 to 20. That's a range of 10. And don't forget to add one. 15 times 10 plus one, 15 times 11. Maybe you just want to distribute here. This is going to be 150, 15 times 10 plus 15 times one, 15. And that should give you 165, okay? So these principles for adding up consecutive integers actually have a lot of parallels when we add up not consecutive integers, but consecutive multiples of some number. So let's move these principles forward. So now we're going to change this to what's the sum of all the multiples of 8 between 70 and 170. Well, we're not working with consecutive integers again. We are now working with what I would call uniformly spaced set, right? All the multiples of eight come regularly, every eight integers. And for uniformly spaced sets, again, they're still symmetrical. So the average is equal to the mean, or excuse me, the average is equal to the median. You all know the average is equal to the mean, right? The average is equal to the median and this second bullet still hurt, uh, holds two. The average is equal to the average of the outer terms. We're gonna to have to adjust this a little bit though. The number of terms is not just equal to the range plus one. I'm not trying to say there's like a hundred multiples of eight between 70 and 170. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna adjust this equation a little bit. And now the number of terms is equal to something similar involving the range and adding one. But now we're going to take the range, divide by that spacing between our terms. So in this case, our spacing is every eight. And then we're going to add one. Dividing by the spacing, that, that actually happens when you're adding up consecutive integers, right? Consecutive integers are uniformly spaced but consecutive integers have a spacing of one. So dividing by one is kind of pointless there, which is why we don't think to do it. But it does hold for consecutive integers as well. So if you're adding up you know, consecutive even numbers, the spacing there would be two, for example. So um, let's go ahead and substitute these items in to our equation. So the sum of terms can now be considered the average of the outer terms, our first multiple of eight, our last multiple of eight. Let's find their average. And then we'll figure out the range, divide by our spacing, which is eight, and add one back. Let's see what happens. Average of the outer terms. Well, 70 and 170 aren't really my outer terms because those aren't multiples of eight. What are my outer terms going to be in this problem? Go ahead and let me know in chat. I'm gonna catch up on some of these messages. I shouldn't have tried catching up on the messages because now everybody's uh, throwing in their answers here. Cool, I think we've got this. 72 is the first multiple of eight beyond 70. So let's go ahead and get 72 in here. And eventually we get to, ooh, good, 168. Like how do we know 168 is the last one? Do, you don't have your multiples of eight memorized through 170? I think we just gotta find one kind of near 170 and then start going up incrementally. So if 16 is a multiple of eight, 160 is a multiple of eight, and that means 168 is the next one and the last one in our list. Yeah, this recording should be put on YouTube at some point. 
for better or for worse, depends on how the rest of this goes. Um, so we could like actually write all these out. I don't recommend it because this looks like a huge pain. All right, it's gonna take forever. But if we use our nice equation here, uh, we have a way to cut through a lot of this. So the average of the outer terms, the average of 72 and 168, let's kind of figure that out. We'll sum them up. That's the same as seven. That's actually the same as 70 plus 170. Okay, I'm just gonna move the two from 72 over to 168. That looks like 240 over two, and that's gonna be 120. So 120 is the average of the entire set because it's the average of the outer terms. Let's figure out the range. What is the range of my numbers? The range of my multiples of eight here. Yeah, again, we're not going from 70 to 170 because those aren't numbers that I'm adding up. The first number I add up is 72. The last one is 168. This has a gap of almost 100. 72 to 172 would be 100. This is four short of that. So this is a gap of 96. The spacing is every eight numbers. 96 divided by eight, that one is on the multiplication uh, table. <laughs> um, 21 times eight is not, but 12 times eight is, 96 divided by eight is 12. We're gonna add one to that and get 13 and multiply it by 120. Yeah, it's definitely gonna be 96 here, right? I mean, you can check, right? 96 plus 72, the six plus the two will add up to the eight in 168. It will not work if this were 94 or 95 or something like that. So a quick way to check. And here we go. So we got 120 times 13. I think at this point you could probably just sketch this out um, kind of the old fashioned way. It's been a while since I've done this. Three times zero is zero. Three times two is six. Three, one, two, two, one. Add that up and it should be 1560, which is answer D. There we go. Cool. All right. Any questions on this one? Based on the answer choices I received earlier, this was the, the one you had the least, the least trouble with. That's good. I think of the three, this one's probably the easiest one. All right, let me go back and just double check that I got everyone's questions. Yes. Um, yes, it is true for all consecutive integers sets, it doesn't matter how many consecutive integers there are, right? If there are four consecutive integers, the average is the median and the average is the average of the outer two terms. If there were 499 consecutive integers, the average is the median, and the average of the whole set is the average of the outside terms. Yeah, let me clear this up a little bit, and I had a request to just go back to the previous slide, so let me do that. Here's the previous slide. Yeah, if you wanna screenshot this, this is totally fine. I, I also won't know. So, cool, let's keep going. All right, problem two, okay. 130 can be expressed as the sum of which of the following? Hmm, I'm kind of interested in knowing how people proceeded through this. Did we try to find four consecutive integers that added up to 130 and five consecutive integers that added up to 130 and six consecutive integers? Was anyone able to find like four specific consecutive integers that add up to 130? I think you could just kind of brute force this one. All right, got some some good, uh, some good spans of numbers in here. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, let's just go ahead and try this. I've got some suggestions. And one thing you could do is be like, well, 
I know four consecutive integers are awfully close to one another. So if four of the same number add up to 130, four times what's 130? Well, four times 30 is 120. So what if I added up these four numbers? We can kind of trial and error this thing. Well, 30 plus 31, that's 61. 32 plus 33 is 65. You add those up, you get 126. So I'm close, okay, I'm close. So that means let's go to the next group of four consecutive integers. Let's replace 30 with 34. And rather than add them all up again, just realize, hey, I've added four when I've gone from 30 to 34. So I should be able to add four here, get to 130. And that means, yeah, Roman numeral one works. I should be able to do this. Yeah, other ways to do it that uh, I'm getting in chat as well. I do want to, I don't want to do this for Roman numeral two and Roman numeral three right now. I do want to connect this problem though to a little bit of what we did on the previous question, some of that foundational work. So remember that we can rewrite, I did add 32, I added 32, I added 30, let's see if I can go find this. Yeah, there's 32. I know it looks like a seven, but the 32 and the 33 added up to 65. So I added up the first two, 61. The second pair was 65. And now I'm going to add those. It's my handwriting. I would blame it on the stylus, but at this point, like I can't behind, hide behind that anymore. Uh, I've been having bad handwriting for too long. It's clearly not the stylus, it's me. So Let's bring back this formula. Average is equal to the sum of the terms over the number of terms, but we're dealing with consecutive integers here. So we can actually replace the word average here with median, right? Because when you're dealing with any evenly spaced set or uniformly spaced set, uh, the median and the average are the same. So I also have some other ingredients here, right? I know I'm looking to see if the sum could be 130. And for Roman numeral one, I'm going to add up four terms. And so what this is asking us with Roman numeral one is essentially this. If I substitute 130 in for the sum and four for my number of terms, is it possible for 130 over four to be the median of four consecutive integers? Hmm. Let's go ahead and give us some gaps for four consecutive integers, what is 130 divided by four? Well, the median has to be a decimal and not just any decimal. It has to be a 0.5 decimal, right? It has to exist directly in between two integers and that means it's something and a half. So 130 over four, we could just do this over here. You know what, I'm gonna do this as 120 over four plus 10 over four. I don't know, I'm feeling the 120s today. This is 30, 10 over four is two and a half. So this is 32 and a half as my median and 32 and a half can be a median, right? That situates 32 and 33 around it, 31 and 34 here and look, these are the same four numbers we had earlier. So Roman numeral one is good. Let's go ahead and give it the, uh, the heart icon. Now we have to try that for the other two. So take a moment and see if we can answer these questions. Is it possible for 130 over five to be the median of five consecutive integers? Like what would that look like? And same thing for six consecutive integers. Well, think about what it means for the median of five consecutive integers, right? Remember the median of four consecutive integers, we said was a decimal, it was a half. But five consecutive integers, the median has to be a whole number it has to be one of the integers themselves. 
And so we would ask then, if I divide 130 by five, do I get an integer? And the answer is yes, right? Because 130 is clearly divisible by five. It's divisible by 10, so it's divisible by five. 130 over five is 26. And then you'd be able to fill out the remaining integers in the list. So Roman numeral two also holds up, good stuff. If I add up these five integers, I will get 130. All right, what about the last one? Mm, Lloyd, I don't, uh, I think that works, that would work. Yes, I was I got a little confused as to where you, you were positioning N in your list, but that would work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like you're positioning, you're positioning N to the, in the middle or just to the left of center. Yeah, but that would work. Yeah, so Cynthia, Cynthia says, nope. <laughs> Very succinct, nope. Um, I'm gonna explain why, another reason why this is impossible later, but let's try 130 over six, that's, well, let's do it like we did earlier. 120 over six plus 10 over six. That's equal to 20 plus 10 sixes, I guess one and two thirds. One and four six, which is one and two thirds. So 21 and two thirds. That's gonna be a problem. 21 and two thirds can be between two integers, but it cannot be the median of two integers. Uh, it will not be directly in between. And so this one's gonna be impossible. And again, you could try adding up six integers to see what happens. Like if I say, mm, you know what, it's about 20. Let me try this, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. Well, that's the same as 20, 20 plus one, 20 plus two, 20 plus three, 20 plus four, 20 plus five. That's six 20s in there. So that's my 120. So my six 20s is 120 and one, two, three, four, five. We did this earlier. We added those up. That was 15. So that's 135. Okay, so this is too much. Let's go ahead and replace 25 with 19. And if you do that, you will decrease by six. And if you subtract six from 135, you'll end up with 129. So the integers 19 through 24 are close, but they will not add up to 130. And the next set of six integers are gonna be too much. So Roman numeral three does not work. Roman numerals one and two do. Roman numeral three does not. I have to clear the screen here. I remember one and two were good. Three was not one and two only. And we'll go with answer C here. Woo, all right. So again, there's a couple ways you can do this. You can brute force these things, which you know sometimes is faster. I think a lot of people got uh, a right answer here. Um, and maybe they didn't do it my way, but it's nice to develop that flexibility of thinking through uh, all these possibilities. Cool, any questions on that second problem? All right, now I'm interested in seeing what we got for problem three. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put up a poll. Uh, I'd like you to tell me what answer you chose for problem three. Okay, I've got a little over, uh, I've got over half the votes in. If you haven't voted, um, go ahead and take another 10 seconds to do it unless you have no idea. All right, so there is no clear winner here. Let's see if I can uh, publish this poll. Oh, um, it's okay, uh, Sharon, I already know what answer you picked. <laughs> 
Um, so you're good. Here are the results of the poll. Um, D is the winner, but it's, it is not a runaway. Yeah. Any of you watch the, the Jeopardy greatest of all time contest? I didn't, but I heard about it. Okay, and I know what happened. I will not spoil it for you. Okay, so a lot, no, um, really no, really no consensus here. We're kind of all over the place. And I don't know if you can see on the video um, what the poll results, poll results are, uh, but every answer choice has multiple uh, people choosing it. And answer D is the winner with only 33% of the votes. So pretty spread out here. All right, we're gonna do something a little different to dive into this problem. I wasn't sure how this was gonna work, but we're going to, um, <laughs> I've always wanted to do this, but I've never found a good time to do it. We're gonna do it now. Have you ever heard of the mutilated chessboard? Of course not, why would you have? Um, but we know what a chessboard is, right? It's this eight by eight um, layout, 64 squares, right? What I'm gonna do is I want to take away um, opposite corners on this chessboard so it looks a little bit different. I think about this shape now. I guess there's 62 squares because I just took away two. And I want you to consider, like if you had 31 of these rectangular dominoes, right? 31 dominoes for the 62 spaces, um, how could you cover up all of the remaining boxes. Hmm. <laughs> Running through the, the permutations. I, I don't know how many ways you might be able to kind of configure these 31. It would have to be a number that has many, many digits. I imagine like supercomputers would be needed here. Um, but it's kind of a trick question. Uh, how can you cover the new board with 31 dominoes of size two by one? Uh, you cannot. It is impossible to cover the entire board. All right, so why is it impossible to cover the entire board? Do you have an idea? Let me know in the chat room. And it's not because I tested out all, 30, all, all, all the ways I could lay out 31 dominoes. Mm, uh, the sides are odd. Hmm, not, not getting any hits yet. I, I know that, I mean, this side is, uh, yeah, you can't split the, uh, you can't break the dominoes in half. We'll Let's be nice to the dominoes. Um, yeah, it kind of looks like this is seven by seven, but then there's this other little layer here that adds another, I guess another 13 square. So there's still 62. Um, six, I have 62 is not divisible by four. I don't know if I need 62 to be divisible by four, right? Two is not divisible by four. Six, like these six here, let me just highlight. Um, these six here aren't divisible by four, but I could certainly cover those up with three dominoes. I don't have 63 boxes. I have 62 boxes, right? There were 64 and I just got rid of these two. There's definitely 62 boxes. Hmm. Think about this. Every domino, no matter how you lay it out on this board, every domino has to cover up one white I guess in this case, one gray, because the white wouldn't show up very well, but one gray and one black square. It doesn't matter where you lay these things out. Each one's going to cover up one of each color. The problem here is I started this diagram with even numbers, right? 60 four total squares, 32 blacks and 32 whites. I took away two of the black squares. So now you 
always have two extra whites. So when you start covering them one at a time with these dominoes, you're always gonna have two more whites than blacks. And so you can never, that last domino you wanna lay down, there'll be two white squares and it'll be impossible because two white squares are never laid out adjacently like this. Kind of an interesting way to think about this problem. Now, what does that have to do with consecutive integers, Jeff? Um, uh, I said this was maybe a little bit of a stretch, but let's see if we can work our way up to it. So I wanna use this idea to kind of show, and maybe you already know why, the sum of two consecutive integers has to be odd. Right? No matter what the two consecutive integers are, the sum has to be odd. Because if I alternate even and odd integers, right? When you have a list of consecutive integers, whenever you change the next one, you've gone from even to odd or the other way, but they alternate. And so whenever I take two of them, I am guaranteed that one of them is gonna be even and one of them is gonna be odd. Just like on the chessboard, one of the squares was always gray and one of them was always black. So if I move this here, I still have an odd and an even. And if I move it all the way down the line, I still have one even and one odd. And the sum of an even and an odd, no matter what they are, will always be odd. All right, on board. Let's think about this one. All right, why is this the case? Think about this and tell me why you believe this must be true in chat. Yeah, good Zach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good Richard. Yeah, again, I can draw out kind of a similar alternation of evens and odds. And no matter which four I pick, right, you're guaranteed to have two evens and two odds. The two evens would add together to be even. The two odds would combine to be a sub total of even. And when you add up those new totals, you get another even. Yeah, two odds always add up to even. So even if I move this down, again, still two odds, two evens. I move this down, you can still see uh, there's two O's and two E's in the box at all time. When this O leaves, this O on the right enters. Okay, let's look at this one. The sum of six consecutive integers must be odd, right? Same principle. This is another reason why Roman numeral three on the previous problem uh, was not going to work, right? 130 cannot be the sum of six consecutive integers because the sum of six consecutive integers must be odd. I have a shortcut to Roman numeral three there. Because if I cover up six integers, you're guaranteed to have three evens and three odds. It doesn't matter where this box ends up. You're always gonna have three of each. And three of each will always add up to odd. I don't know, what do you think? Does the, does the chessboard work? <laughs> Maybe. All right, let's see how that works. Uh, three consecutives is, uh, let's still talk about that. What about three consecutive integers? Can we say anything conclusive about the sum of three consecutive integers? Why not? I'm getting some no's. Hmm, yeah, there's two options here, right? If you, like three consecutive integers, like these three will add up to odd, uh, but these three will add up to even, right? Because you have two odds that combine to an even. So it's not predictive when you have a, the sum of an odd number of integers, but when you have the sum of an even number of integers, you know half of them will be even, half of them will be odd, and then you can make a, a verdict. That's a good question. All right.
Now we can start moving on to products. The products of two consecutive integers must be even, right? Same principle, because you're guaranteed for one of these to be even, and as soon as you multiply a bunch of integers by one even integer, the whole product turns even, right? You could multiply a million odd integers, the product will be odd. You multiply that whole thing by two, the product, it's like dropping a, putting a drop of food coloring in a glass, like the whole thing turns blue or whatever color it was. The whole product turns even once you have one even in there. All right. Let's think about this principle. And you, know, you notice these are ending in periods. These, <laughs> these are true, but I wanna know why they're true. The product of three consecutive integers must be divisible by six. Let's think about that. This is one that comes up on the GMAT fairly often, I think. And the previous one, this one here. Why does the product of three consecutive integers uh, always have to be divisible by six? Uh, Sharon, why does it always contain a multiple of three? And Gui, maybe you can chime in too. You guys are saying similar stuff. Always contains a multiple of three. I've just chosen some random integers here. Let's do this. Let's get some blue on here. Let's get some blue on the screen. Um, yeah, like if I, if I take these three integers, 15, 16, 17, well, we know when you have two integers in a row, one of them is going to be even. So when you have three integers in a row, still one of them is going to be even. But we're saying there's also got to be a multiple of three. Well, yeah, ask yourself, how often do multiples of three come around? Well, they come around every third number, right? We've got one here. We've got one here. 21, 24, 27. And so whenever we take our three number group, and I depart from 15, 18 slides in and takes its place. All right, we're cruising along here. I've still got my multiple of three. 18 is also even. Ooh, I get a second even number here. So this is like extra divisible by six, divisible by another even number as well. But then as the 18 leaves, right, the 21 slides back in. So I didn't want to create like a three color checkerboard, but it's the same idea right? You lay down a three by one domino and you are guaranteed to have a number that's a multiple of three, a number that's one less than a multiple of three, and a number that's one more than a multiple of three. In this case, it's one more than 18. Good. All right, let's see, where are we going with this? <laughs> We're going to try to bring this back to problem three here. So again, we're not talking about consecutive integers per se, we're talking about consecutive multiples of three, so still kind of evenly spaced. So what we can do is we could create one of these number lines, if you will, and I'm not gonna fill them in with specific numbers. But let's try to mark off where like four consecutive multiples of three might be, right? We know multiples of three happen every third number, so maybe every third box. So let's just go ahead and, you know, we'll mark them with triangles for threes and say, hey, if this is a multiple of three, then we know this one's not and this one's not, but this one would have to be, right? We, we know a little bit more. What I wanna know is, uh, are we guaranteed for the product of four consecutive multiples of three to be divisible by five. Why or why not? I mean, can you come up with three consecutive or four consecutive multiples of three that, that don't have a, 
that don't have a factor of five in it? Well, Adam, I'll say, yes, the, the product of all these multiples of three will be even, but sometimes even numbers are divisible by five, right? Like a hundred is divisible by five, tens divisible by five. So that can't be, uh, that can't be criteria for eliminating Roman numeral one. I like what um, Sharon's given us. Uh, Richard, careful, those aren't all multiples of three, right? So if the first triangle is three, then this would be four, five, this would be six. You keep going, nine and 12. Guys, and if you multiply all of those, um, you will not end in a zero or a five. And the way to check is none of these have a factor of five within them. So when you put them all together, there's still not a factor of five. And so we've basically proven that you can avoid in four consecutive multiples of three, you can avoid a multiple of five. And I think that's, um, that's kind of nice. Richard, that's another one that'll work. Yes, if you started with 33, 36, 39, 42, that would work. Um, I think 18, 21, 24, 27 would work. 80% of the time you're gonna hit a multiple of five, um, but 20% of the time you won't. And this is uh, a good example of that. Yeah, like if I, if I suppose that like multiples of five occur every five numbers, there is a way to space these multiples of five so that I don't hit the triangles, right? Like if this were zero and five and 10, fives are hurting today, and 15, right? There's no overlap there. <laughs> oh my God, Zach, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what, what that number is. I mean, I believe you, but that's not how I would have done it. So maybe you're right. I just don't know how to like even absorb that into my brain right now. Cool. So what we found is Roman numeral one does not have to be true. Um, and so this says what must be divisible. It must be divisible by which of the following. We've come up with one counterexample, and that means that Roman numeral one is out. All right, let's take a look at Roman numeral two, out of the pentagons and in come the octagons. What about Roman numeral two? Um, if you have four consecutive multiples of three and you multiply them, do you have to get something that's divisible by eight? Oh, Alana, is that true? I don't believe that's true, Alana. For knowing if the product is divisible by eight, you take the sum of the last four digits and see if that's divisible by eight. Um, no, you, that's not going to work all the time because you could just come up with something like this, right? The last four digits add up to eight, which is divisible by eight, but this is an odd number, so it can't be divisible by eight. Yeah, there's not a great way to <laughs> show divisibility by eight. I mean, the rule is like if the last three digits not that they sum up to a multiple of eight, but if the last three digits themselves are a multiple of eight, um, then the entire thing was, that's not that helpful because then you have to see if like numbers all the way to 998 are divisible by eight. Hmm. Okay, getting a, getting a bunch of things in text here. Let's see, and in chat here, let's see what's going on. Um, Max, I'm going to try to come back around to that later. Okay. All right. So can we, like, does this always have to be the case that eight's going to be a factor of the product of these numbers? Hmm. Well, I think one thing we could do is maybe try the same thing we did with the pentagons, right? We were able to kind of space, space the pentagons out and see like, hey, there's no factor of five in the triangle numbers. Can we do that with the octagons too? Like I'm avoiding multiples of eight with my triangles. So it seems like maybe Roman numeral two doesn't have to work. What do we think about that? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, there's some disagreement here. 
Ooh, Zach says it does. Well, let's see. Let's go back to plugging these numbers in. Six, or three, six, nine, and 12. Yeah, none of those are multiples of eight, right? But if I rearrange this a little bit and say, hey, this is 27, right? And this is 72. Uh, 72 is a multiple of eight. So it's not enough to avoid the stop signs here, right? So why is there a multiple of eight when I don't, why is the product of all of these triangles gonna be a multiple of eight if I don't have a multiple of eight in any of the terms themselves? Ooh, Ooh interesting. Uh, Sharon says, because it's not prime. That is a good point. I believe you can use that. A eight doesn't follow the same rules as five here because there are, there are other ways to get multiples of eight than just having multiples of eight as your ingredients, right? If, um, for example, like two times four is a multiple of eight, but neither of these terms is themselves, but combined they have kind of some property that allows there to be a multiple of eight. That's not gonna work with five because five, there's no way to multiply two integers to get to five other than one in itself. So there are no like building blocks on the way to eight, which is I guess what you're saying that eight's not prime. That's definitely true. Yeah, so let's think about this a little bit more from, and I'm getting some good uh, ideas here in chat. Let's think about this from the perspective of evens and odds again, okay? If you have four consecutive multiples of three, can you tell me anything about the evens and odds there? So let's just suppose that this first one's even, right? That would make the next multiple of three odd. This would be even, this would be odd. That would make this even, and that would make this odd. All right, so we're guaranteed to have two evens and two odds if we start with an even. Let's see what happens if we start with an odd. If we start with an odd, then this would flip to even. This would flip to odd and this would flip to even. Ooh, so you know that when you start multiplying like enough even numbers, that means you're in, like you're bringing in, you're importing factors of two. Well, if you bring in enough factors of two, you're gonna be divisible by eight. Now the interesting thing here is I only have two even numbers. You have two even numbers. Is that gonna be enough here for me to be divisible by eight? Hmm. Let's see what types of even numbers these are. Did you know there were different types of even numbers? Let's just go ahead with the first option and knowing that the same principle holds for that row I just deleted. Let's suppose this even number is, hmm, let's just call it, we'll just call it six since it's a triangle as well. Um, that would make this number nine and this number 12 and this number 15. Again, none of these are multiples of eight. But we already found earlier that six times 12 is divisible by eight. How does that happen if I'm only multiplying two even numbers? Hmm, Cynthia, I'm not sure if we want to be summing here. I think the sum is going to help us that much. All right, Harshada, one of them, ooh, okay, here we go. I'm, here they come. One of these evens is actually going to be divisible, not just by two, but by four. All right, so I know six. Six has a factor of two in it, two times three. Nine does not have a factor of two. 
12 has a factor of 2 in it, but it has a second factor of 2 in it as well. Okay, so what's happening here is if I kind of draw in the rest of these things, I'm going to draw in the rest of the evens and the odds. I don't know why I made that one really tiny. I feel bad for it. If your first one just has one factor of two in it, like six, the next even number will have at least two factors of two in it. So eight here, it has, it actually has three. You got, it's extra, extra, extra even. 10 has a factor of two in it, and then 12 has a pair of them. So when you alternate even numbers, you're guaranteed to have multiples of four show up every other even number. And so that is going to happen on at least one of your triangles here. It's kind of tricky, right? But because you have two evens, and these evens are spaced, in this case, six apart, if this one is a multiple of four, this one will not be. But if this one's not a multiple of four, this one will be. So you're actually alternating kind of like the quality of even numbers, the multiples of four and the non-multiples of four. So in this entire diagram, okay, you are guaranteed to have four multiples of three, right? We know that. Two multiples of two, right? Two of these are even numbers, but one of them, one of which is a multiple of four, and it has to happen. So what we could do is we could start writing these out. Three, six, nine, 12. There's your multiple of four. Let's go ahead to the next one, 15, 18, 21, 24. There's a multiple of four, right? You're always going to get one. If I strung these in a row, every four multiples of three, you'll have a multiple of four. You also have another even in there, and that should give you the ingredients to be divisible by eight. Ooh, yeah, I mean, occasionally you can find these. They're, it's kind of tough, um, Alana. They're, they're definitely rare, um, but it's not out of bounds. All right, guys, so here, let's recap this, and we'll move on to number three. Um, Roman numeral one did not have to be true, but it does have to be the case that you're going to get a multiple of eight because you're guaranteed two even numbers, one of which is extra even. You're always going to have one that's extra even. All right, what about 243? Um, I did not have a 243-sided polygon, and I did not draw the number line long enough. But what about the two, what about the number 243? It's kind of an interesting number. Um, like I'll say, I'll be fair. Um, the number 243 will show up on the GMAT far more often than. Um, 244. <laughs> Why is that? Well, 243 is a power of three. It's three to the fifth. Also 343. 343 is underutilized, but that is um, seven cubed. So 243, three to, the, three to the fifth. Are there guaranteed to be five powers of three here? I know I have four factors of three, right? This is a multiple of three, this is a multiple of three, this is a multiple of three, this is a multiple of three. Um, Zach says, yes, there's actually gonna be a fifth multiple of three in there somewhere, or a fifth factor of three. Zach, how do you know? So there was some use of smart numbers. Again, we're kind of, we can rely on just choosing numbers and see, see what happens. Um, 
Carter, you actually multiplied this out. Okay, this is where that number is coming from. You're, you guys are multiplying this out and getting 1944. And then you're seeing if that is divisible by 243 and you're getting eight. Got it. Oh, there's the factor of eight too. Um, ooh, okay. That seems like a lot of work. Uh, multiplying all those numbers and doing the long division does seem like a lot of work. Um, you've found, so here's what's happening. You've found that the product of these four consecutive multiples of three is divisible by 243. Does that mean the product of any four consecutive multiples of three is going to be divisible by 243? Well, Zach, that's impressive. <laughs> Like, I, I dare I add the, the, the digits in front of these? Like, do I know that that's going to be divisible by 243? Don't multiply that. I mean, or do. All right, that's cool. Um, well, any set is a multiple of that set. Um, I don't, I don't know if I see that. Like I, I see how I've multiplied this by 11, but I multiplied this by six. I multiplied this by four and a third. I multiplied this by three and a half. That doesn't seem like this is just a scaling up version of the first, the first four numbers. I don't know if you just elevated the three, six, nine, twelve. All right, so uh, the next set. What extra three? Sorry, I'm busy reading the chat. Hmm. All right. Well, what you can do is you could test numbers. We'll go ahead and test the numbers here, and then we'll use it to prove the rule. All right. This has a factor of three. This has a factor of three. This has two factors of three, and that's the key, right? This one provides the extra factor of three. And 12 has a factor of three. So there's an extra one here. Yeah, I'm, I'm still not, Hmm. Okay, Zach, I think I see it. I think I see it. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so every, every set of four consecutive multiples of three, you're going to have definitely four factors of three. But what you're guaranteed to have whenever you have four consecutive multiples of three is you're guaranteed to have a multiple of nine. Right? Multiples of nine occur every three multiples of three. And so when you have four multiples of three, you're going to have a multiple of nine, and that's going to provide your extra factor of three. So if we change this to, again, 33, 36, 39, 42, 33 has a, a power of three in it, a factor of three in it, 36, has your extra three in it, because it's a multiple of nine. 39 has a factor of three in it, and 42 does as well. Yeah, I'm not breaking up the 14 and four, but showing that there's going to be five factors of three in any four consecutive multiples of three. So this one should also work. Yeah, another way I think you could do this, I don't know if I would do it, but another way to do it is to say, hey, if this is a multiple of three, this is three times x, and x is an integer. We'll call it x is equal to an integer. This is going to be three times x plus one, right? It's the next multiple of three. This is three times x plus two. And three times x plus three. All right, Zach, well, let's see what happens here. Because all of these are multiplied, here's what you have. You have three to the fourth, and then you're multiplying x 
by x plus one, x plus two, and x plus three. Well, remember, x is an integer. So what do you have here? I think Sharon said it earlier, these are consecutive integers, and in three consecutive integers, you're guaranteed to have a multiple of three. So somewhere in here, if x is an integer, you're guaranteed to have another multiple of three, and that means you'll have at least three to the fifth, which is 243. Um, yeah, Alana, I think so. Um, if you don't have a good kind of knowledge of how to do this and like the patterns of consecutive, of consecutive multiples, um, you're gonna run into trouble here. So this is one of those things you just kind of have to know. I would not try um, figuring it out on the spot. This would be a problem to dump. So that's gonna be uh, eight and 243 both work. And that's gonna be answer E. That one's a, that's a, I think is a pretty brutal problem. Yes. I just wanted to put the, the checkerboard or the chessboard in there. So now this problem was just fodder for that. Yeah, is there a good resource for learning all these rules? Um, you can find some of this stuff. I know, I don't know all the resources out there. I know our quant books um, on their consecutive integer chapters do talk about it a little bit. Um, yeah. Cool, I did say I would throw this problem up for the recording. This was the bonus problem. Um, I don't think I have time to talk through it, but if you are wondering how to approach this problem, I think you should go back and look at the discussion of problem two uh, and kind of that concept of, you know, sums divided by some number of terms equaling potential medians. I believe that's the best way to do this one. Um, I'm going to say the answer to this problem in about 10 seconds. So if you wanna, if you're watching this on the recording, you don't wanna know the answer, go ahead and pause it. This one is tough. Um, it was, I made, I made all these problems up. So, you know, if you, if you hate them, you can blame me. Uh, it was tough that I had to double check it a couple times to make sure I wasn't messing it up. Um, the answer to this problem is, is E. The answer to this problem is E. All right. Um, <laughs> N could equal in this problem both 15 Ooh, I do not believe it can be 10, Gui. Statement one, n could be 10, not in statement two. And this might be worth just kind of going through. Um, why can 90 not be the sum of 10 consecutive integers? It's kind of based on what we learned today. 90 cannot be the sum of 10. Oh, there's two, two reasons. <laughs> oh, JD just pulled through. JD says 10 consecutive integers will always be odd. And he is correct. 10 consecutive integers will have five evens and five odds in it. And the five odds add up to odd. Yeah, um, so... 10 is a number that would work in statement one, like along with 15. Uh, 10 does not work in statement two. Another way to think about that, if, if there were n consecutive integers that added up to 90, the average would be nine. That would mean the median is nine. And the median can't be nine when you have 10 terms. Because if you have 10 terms, the median has to exist in the crack. So 10 doesn't work. Um, 15 works for both and 45 actually works for both. So an exercise, I do not have all the um, potential values for n in statement one and statement two, but the ones that satisfy both conditions are 15 and 45. Um, you, it might be, you know, I don't know if you find these fun at all, I kind of do, but think about all the values that could work for n in just statement one, all the values that could work for n in just statement two. Um, and there's a, a very little overlap of two numbers there. I think I'm going to wrap it up there. That one, uh, that one's a good one. Um, good and horrible. <laughs>